Hey, what's up, guys? Nick Davenport here, aka Mr. Mental Muscle. We have a special guest today on episode seven of the Mental Breakdown podcast, Marine Shea, aka the real million dollar baby. Now, we're going to talk about a lot of things today. She has a, a very unique background, not just in the fighting world, but just in life in general. So I'll give you a little time to introduce yourself because I, I probably won't do it justice. So. <laughs> Let's well, talk. my name is Maureen Shea. I am a two-time world champion boxer. I've been boxing since I was 17 years old. Um, I was I competed as an amateur from 21 to 24, turned pro when I was 24. But what led me to boxing was really um, what was interesting. I was actually in an abusive relationship when I was 17 years old, and um, I went to the gym to better myself for him. Walked into the back. There was a boxing ring. And I fell in love with the sport. Um, but what the sport did was really rebuild me as, as, a, as a woman. You know, I realized I suffered from a very low self-esteem. I had a lot of um, issues in my family with mental health. My father was bipolar. My uncle was bipolar. Um, I suffered with uh, depression. Um, I've dealt with um, eating disorder. Um, you know, I've done drugs, you know, when I was younger. And I realized I wasn't a drug addict, but I was using um, outside things to kind of, like, fill voids in my life. And it took a lot of therapy and a lot of... Uh, self self-realization of what was going on nice. and so i've done a lot of work <laughs> so it seems if mental health is a topic you can definitely talk about it so we know each other so it's not like this is our first time meeting so i definitely know a little bit about you and i want to talk more things like your perspective because mental health gets this wrap of just either you have it or you don't or it just it can't be changed and obviously that makes no sense because it wouldn't be a need for psychologists or even someone like me who does more to the applied mental training and i know you're big on the connection of the mind and the body and obviously my company's called mind body one so what are your thoughts on that because i think you did a, a post a few days ago and i saw it and you told me let's do this mm -hmm. and you were going in on how people kind of divide the two and obviously i agree so what, what what do you think on that well what i noticed is athletes um particularly athletes and that's what i've noticed and i i was having a conversation the other day with somebody i said you know i've been very fortunate to be almost a fly on the wall being a female boxer um now everybody knows about you know female mma fighters female boxers but back when i started you know back in 98 1998 okay. um you know really female boxing was not i mean we've been around but women's boxing wasn't the olympics you didn't know about mm -hmm. these other names you know we weren't um you know on tv P people knew who Layla ali was because oh, yeah. of muhammad ali people knew who christy martin was because of her epic fight on the mic Tyson undercard where Don King gave her an opportunity, but that's it. It was almost like one-offs. You know, people really didn't know a lot of females. So for me, being in the gym was kind of weird for the guys and for them to have to accept it, they kind of ignored me. You know, I mean, they didn't completely ignore me, but to the point it's like, it was more about them and I had to kind of conform to their world. And I kind of did, but I, I recognized a lot of things and I saw the difference. I also had to learn from these guys. So I'm watching, I'm like, oh, it didn't seem natural to me to do certain things where they were doing it, which is um, a lot of overworking. I did feel that I started to develop that personality, and I think it's from being around the fighters that I was raised with. Um, hard work, you know, but no pain, no gain. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to go hard, go hard, or go home. Like, it feels I like you're not working if you don't feel like you're about to pass out, yeah. or it's like you're, you're less than if you don't fall out on the end of the workout. Yes, and I also that but i also struggled with low self-esteem so i never thought i was good enough so in that kind of environment i felt like if i didn't work till that point i wasn't good enough or i wouldn't be accepted you know and i don't know mm -hmm. if they felt that way they'd have to explain that to you but i know Probably. for me i felt like i had to do that and especially as a female i was in the boys club and i had to be more like the boys than the girls mm -hmm. you know like so that was life. Exactly. And I also went through like identity issues too. Like, am I like, what, what am I, who am I, you know, cause I wasn't raised in boxing. And again, I got into the sport for other reasons. So, um, I did have a sports background where I did play different sports, but I think my mental health was what really led me to the boxing was because I had issues with like being impulsive and things like that. So back to my post, I don't want to go off on the <laughs> rail. We'll talk more about that. But going back to my post, I realized that a lot of fighters, this is now I'm going on 26 years in the sport, more than half my life. And from that time and experience, I sit back and being in huge camps, I mean, I'm talking high level camps with, uh, you know, former world champions, current world champions. And I noticed the overworking of these guys. Um, and, and some of the females, but mostly the guys that they feel like, oh, they're going to get in better shape. They're going to get in better shape. And I feel like, and you can, attest, you can tell me this more on this. I feel like it's almost like the same thing with like the military or the police department where oh, yeah. men don't, you know, a man going to therapy is looked at as a weakness and they don't really focus on the mental health. So I think coming up in this sport, the way that I didn't seeing what I did in the, in the late nineties to now seeing how that whole dynamic and that whole effect is now taking place in these fighters. They think that, oh, if I show mental weakness, then I'm, I'm too weak. 
but if I, you know, or, but if I don't, if I don't work my body, then I'm going to be, I'm not going to win where mm-hmm. it's, and I think that the mind tricks you to thinking that you're not physically in shape. Oh yeah. It's but wired you, for that. It's so literally you wired are, to keep yeah. you less like, because at ancient times, like now it's 2022, but ancient times movement was for survival. We mm-hmm. only were moving when we needed to. Yeah. Now we move for fun. We move for exercise, we move for whatever. So it's like our brain is wired to say, calm that down. So you have to override that. So that's what that is. So that really is what's And happening. now look at boxing. I mean, I'm only going to speak on boxing because I'm not an MMA fighter, but I'm sure they go through the same thing. I just don't want to speak on that, that part because God it's bless them. I mean, I'm sure it is. Yeah. But I'm thinking like, listen, if somebody's breaking my arm, me, I'm going to be like, I'm done. <laughs> you know what I mean? Boxing, it's a little different. If somebody's punching me in the face, going to my body, I'm not going to quit. I'm going to find that fortitude mm-hmm. to push forward. Um, so that's why I'm talking about that part. But that's where we have to. So we have to almost override that pain that, that, you know, that, that pain alert to be able to still perform. Like, for example, I mean, I fought with a blown ear drum. It was, it was literally muscle memory and will that carried me through that fight because I couldn't even stand up, you know? And then, you know, I fought broken noses. I tore the ligament in my wrist. I actually, I broke my hand and then I ended up t- tearing the ligament. So I went into the fight with a broken hand, overrode that pain to say, okay, just fight. I fought with the broken hand and then ended up tearing the ligament in the third round and fought five rounds with one hand and won the fight. So, there's there's a good thing in being able to do that, but it's also what what was the what was the outcome of that? I ended up being out of the ring for a year. It's that trade off. And I had a cast for three months. You know what I mean? So it's knowing, and now I go back and I'm like, oh, shoulda, woulda, coulda, but it's already done. So what it is now that I'm seeing with a lot of fighters is like they push the work, and even these old school trainers, you know. Um, But I think it really starts with the athlete. I think the athlete needs to know themselves mentally and physically. And I always talk about the spiritual aspect of it just because, you know, I'm a Christian. God is my higher power. And, you know, I I pray. And that's where I find my peace. I know other people have, you know, whatever their beliefs are, you know, and that's fine. But I think the mental and the physical when it comes to athletics and it comes to sport, you know, that plays such a huge impact in what happens you know, with the outcome. And I think people can ride the talent for so long, but at some point what's happening out here is going to affect what's going Mm -hmm. on in here. And the reason I talk about this is because I've experienced it and I can look back at each fight. And I know if I would have been able to take care of this or not let this affect me, this fight would have been a heck of a lot easier for me. Mm -hmm. I made it a lot harder on myself. And that's where I've learned now. I, I have to take care of this part first before I can take care of this part. So you talk about like the breaking the hands, ligaments, and that's something to be ironic. You're a fighter, so you fight through it. But just going back to what I've seen in my experience with high level performance, made another point of where do they go? Because not everyone's going to have that talent forever. And at the highest level, most people you fought, correct me if I'm wrong, were just as talented, but you have to have something extra. So at that level, it's not even about talent anymore. And it goes back to the mental, this cliche, right? They always say it's 90% mental, 10% physical. But going to your points, where does that 90% come from? Because people say that, and from my experience, I don't really see it. Obviously, my business is around it, yeah. but I don't really see it. Maybe you can att- attend to that. Like, where does that actually come from? I think with everybody, it's different. I think with every individual, it's a little bit different. Um, I know I had an experience the other day, and I've been feeling this way for, for, for a couple of years now. But I think it what happens outside of the ring And when I say outside of the ring, I mean your personal life. I'm talking your family. I'm talking your relationships with friends. I'm talking romantic relationships. I'm talking your relationship with food because a lot of fighters deal with, you know, eating disorders because they have Mm -hmm. to make weight. You know, I'm talking about your relationship with alcohol. I'm talking about relationships. And I think people understand relationships, any relationship you have with anything is going to affect your life. You know, and I think that's the first thing in understanding and taking a look at your relationships. Um, But I think it's a little bit different for everybody. So going back to the other day, I was in the ring and I was, I sparred uh, one girl for four rounds and I, I just p- kind of played around with her. And then, and, and she's, she's a young up and coming amateur, very talented. She's getting better. And I love working with her and I was playing and I got out of the ring and, and one of the gentlemen that was there, was like, Hey, how do you feel? And I turned around and, and I'm a very honest person. So especially when I'm in the moment, I turned around and looked at him and I said, I'm the best. Nobody can beat me. And I meant it. And I can tell you that a lot of people fake it till you make it, yep. but I'm not faking it anymore. But it took a lot of work, not the physical work, the mental work is what I got to say. The 90% physical and mental is what it took for me to get to this place to really believe this and then to display it. 
and to be in control at all times, but also to know if, I mean, I'm going to go in there and say, yeah, I'm going to win every fight, but what happens in a fight? I mean, listen, Floyd Mayweather said it, one shot could change a career. Yeah. So what happens in that moment where maybe something happens? You got to be able to pivot, adjust, change, figure out a new game plan. You can't go through the mental toughness where it's like, oh no, I'm going to stand here and fight you. Yeah. When it's like, no, step back, reassess, box, move around. That's a misconception that mental toughness is only going to you fall out. Sometimes you have to back up and pivot and do the different thing because with mental toughness, I always talk about the mentally as toughest people know when they're beat or know when they need to fall back because going back to like the physical aspect, it could get you in your sport seriously hurt. If you know, okay, I don't need to fight right now. I need to take that time off. And that's, we talked about this before exactly. the other day, athletic identity. So you feel like if, if I don't fight, I'm a punk. Or especially the fight, I know it's cliche because you are a fighter, but this happens in other sports. But with fighters, I've noticed probably more than any other sport, if you don't step up, whether it's some of the cognitive drills that I do, whether it's sparring, they feel if they don't step up, they're a punk or loser, and they're tying their self-worth into the sport, which- Or the I, moment, yeah. Yeah, and it's like- but that's always, anything. You know, I always say athlete is, is what you are, not who you are. It's what you do. But it's listen, a part of your personality, but it isn't who you are. But it took, but so you can tell anybody that, and they'd be like, yeah but they're not applying that. And I was like that. That's why, you know, I was talking today to two of the interns that we had at the gym when Kaylin was running me through my workout. And um, I was kind of like giving them, dropping some knowledge on them too, because I remember when I was older and I mean, when I was younger and people would tell me like, oh, you don't know. And I'm like, I know everything. And I feel like in the twenties, like when you're in your twenties, it's like that time where you think you really know everything and you look at older people like annoying, you know? I mean, I think in my thirties, I listen more to older people, but I think some people in their twenties, they still, not all, but a lot of them, I know at least I was where I was like, they don't know, they don't know. And then I realized, well, I don't know, you know? So now I know in my thirties, I was like, you know what? You don't know anything. You got to just, but I think it's that when people tell you this, a lot of people, or they ask how, how do I fix that? What do I do? And I think the biggest thing that fighters, the, the biggest thing that fighters don't want to be is the word called vulnerable. But what does that mean? Vulnerable. So you got to understand how that application or what that, what that is and how you define that. Cause I feel like, you know, vulnerability is recognizing your weaknesses yeah. or looking at where you need to fix. But a lot of people don't like to be vulnerable because of the, what they think the word is. So how you define the word? Cause in a fight, you don't want to be vulnerable in a fight unless you're, 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 unless you're setting them up, you know, like what did rope a dope, you know, Muhammad Ali put him on the ropes to make himself vulnerable. But then he had a counterpart after that. He knew what he was going to do after that, but that also took a toll, you so know, almost having a, uh, constructive vulnerability. Like, yes. It can't just be, I'm open. Yes. That can get you hurt exactly. physically and emotionally. So, and that's why I think they correlate like a lot of life and boxing. But mm -hmm. I think they. Roll with know, the punches. <laughs> 100%. Yeah, exactly. You know, and, and I think that's, you know, that really goes with what we're talking about, you know? So I think like when you're thinking about things outside, like I had to look at my relationship with food, you know, I developed, well, I had an eating disorder, you know, I was a compulsive eater. I had gone up to 180 pounds multiple times in my oh, life. Wow. I couldn't picture at 180. I've seen you. Yeah, I know the biggest, 122, 130, like, 135. Where are we at now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I've always been bigger. lean, but then this is me young, um, that weight. And and I can give you a picture. You can put it in here if you want yeah, to. I wanna, yeah. yeah, let's put that <laughs> up in like, there. What? But, I can't see it, but I, I want to see the picture. Yeah, and I, and, but what it was, was, it was my relationship with food, and I was trying to almost like I was self harming, you know? So instead mm -hmm. of drugs, my drug of choice was food. So I would self, it has I would self medicate patterns and I would self medicate with food and, and it was, it got to the point where, and I think a lot of people do, but people like, well, you know, and I think that's the hardest, you know, drug to beat because you need Ooh. to eat to live. You yeah, don't need I, to do cocaine that's to good, live. That's a good point. You don't I, need to smoke pot to live. A, you just made a good point. I've never really, and that's funny because you know my, I was a clinical psychology mm -hmm. major and get my doctor and I had to do um, a few case studies and one I chose was anorexia and I also talked about binge eating disorder. And it's like, that's interesting you say that because I've also worked in drug addictions. So I've seen both sides. So it's like, you're right. Cocaine, while you get addicted to it, physiologically speaking, your brain only is only tricked to think you need it. You but with need food, it. you have to eat. You can only go, what, at best, 20 days. And that's like excruciating days. It's not like you're going to be chilling to day 17 and you're like, oh, dang, I'm hungry. It's like day one, you're going to be like withdrawal. And it's like, so that, that, that was a good point. You got to figure that. And I learned that and I went to Overeaters Anonymous meetings. I did 90 meetings in 90 oh, days. I don't that either. Yeah. So they have so, and that's, they have, so that's the thing. So, um, you know, I had, I dealt with alcoholism in my family. So I went to Al-Anon and I'd gone to, I went to Al-Anon my first meeting when I was 21 years old. 
and um, I didn't realize how the effects of alcohol on other people's lives was affecting my life. So this all started because I had to look at myself first. I wasn't like blaming everybody else. I'd look at myself and see what my problems were. Where, where were my relationships suffering? And one of my particular relationships, I realized why it was suffering. I had to look at that person and say, okay, what is it about that person that is triggering me or affecting me? And how can I control that? I can't control the person. I can only control how it affects me. And I realized there was one thing that this person was doing that I couldn't, when they drank, it affected me and I couldn't stop them from drinking, but I didn't understand. I didn't know how to not let their use of alcohol affect me until I met a friend of mine. I talked to him about it. And I, I wasn't as articulate about it then as I am now because I yeah. obviously know because I went to the meetings and I did the work. But back then I remember I was just saying, Hey, I have this issue and this person does this and whatever. And I don't know what to do. And I know I can't change them, but how do I help myself? And then he said, well, I go to AA and it sounds like he's an alcoholic. And I think you'd benefit from, you know, um, Al Anon, which is for family and friends of alcoholics. And so I went and I remember my first meeting and if anybody's gone to meetings, you know, everybody kind of shares and I'm sitting there and all of a sudden I just started crying because I realized I wasn't crazy that there was a way for me to heal myself, not them. Cause what I was trying to do was fix them and you're not going to fix them. You got to fix yourself. So then I realized that. So then I started realizing, wow, there's a pattern here with me with food. Every time that I would get depressed, I would, I would binge eat. And I'm talking like four or 5,000 calories in a sitting. Oh, wow. Like it was bad. So for perspective, for those out there, the average, just average size man or woman is not going to get more than 1,500 at best, 2,000 calories. So to give you some perspective out there, 5,000 is about almost triple the average daily recommendation. So give you some perspective. So that's how much calories of food you were eating. Yeah, it was bad. And it was, and it was like one thing to another. Like, I mean, just to give an example, I would go from one store to the next store to the next store and just keep eating. And I couldn't mm -hmm. even, I, before I got to the next store, I was already done with that meal. So it was, it was one of those things like severe addiction you're in the, the grocery store shopping you ate two bags of chips before you even checked out type of oh, thing. Oh yeah. Well, no, it was like, I'd go to, I'd go to seven 11 and I'd buy a bunch of stuff. And oh. then while on the way to McDonald's, Oh no. Cause I, I didn't, it was hard even. I didn't want to get out of the car. It's interesting. Cause I, I'm trying to picture it in my head and I didn't, it was really almost realize. like, it was almost like, and even like when I would go into certain stores, if I would buy like a lot of candy, I would like make believe I was on the phone telling somebody cause I felt shame. So I'd make believe like, Oh yeah. What else did you want? Meanwhile, it was all for me. Ah, uh. Okay. So talk about, and this is me being like, I'm being completely honest. And I know people that hear this and understand they're like, oh my gosh, like some people don't even realize they're doing it or they know they're doing it, but they're, right. I was a closet eater hundred percent. That's why this is big. Cause you said it when you went to the Al-Anon meetings, you said that it gave you perception of that. I'm not the only one going through this. Mm -hmm. And I think when it comes back to mental health, like you say, with stigma, especially with the male population, and I guess we can kind of segue into that is that they don't think anyone else is doing. So they're like, it must be just me. So like I'll use an example when we talk about like say kids for example and let's go with like uh, I worked with an optometrist a few years back and they gave me this this analogy or not analogy but real life examples of how when kids have trouble seeing and they get prescribed glasses and I see you're wearing glasses I'm not sure what why what did you I'm nearsighted. nearsighted I'm forty that's okay. why <laughs> all right well <laughs> let's let's say when kids are like in their early like fifth or five yeah, years yeah. old to seven year old like kindergarten first grade and he told me that a lot of kids don't ever like talk about it because they assume that this is just how you see. So they don't think that anyone else is going through this because they just figured this is how you're supposed to That's see. That's interesting. And then what will happen is the grades will suffer. That's and they're interesting. Like, oh, they're, they're not that smart. But as the fact is, they just never thought beyond themselves because as, especially as a kid, you don't really know the world. Now let's transfer that to what you're talking about. Oh, yeah. As adults, I, I see a lot of people in the, what I do with the more applied and in the psychological clinical side is like, we seem to just forget that we're all humans. Even like me as a parent, like I have to tell myself, you're not the only one that's got a, a child this age doing this. Like, and I think as humans in any field, we always dismiss that there's other people going through this. So it's funny you say that because this brings me back to something that was said to me and I forgot. I want to say it was my manager that said it to me when I was fighting amateur. Somebody said it to me and it was the most profound thing I ever heard. They said, remember, the girl you're fighting, she's feeling everything you're feeling. Yeah. Exactly. She's going through it too. Don't think that you're in this by yourself. And I've told, I've shared that story and I've shared that those words with so many fighters, male yeah. and female, because that's the thing that we forget. And when we're in this fight or flight and we're in this pressure fight and we're, we have to be so self-focused that I think a lot of people, but what happens is when you think about them and you, we think about our opponents is what if they're stronger? What if they're better? What if they're this? What if they're that? Instead of saying, no, I am this. And then saying, you know what? And whatever I'm feeling, they're feeling it too. Mm -hmm. And even if they're feeling they're better than me, whatever, but I'm still, it's, it's who's going to show it first. Yeah. 
Wait, I want to stop you right there because it's, this is why I appreciate you. And we talk all the time when we see each other about things like this. Not enough. I know. this is For yeah. years since I've been, because they people watch this know a little bit my background. So, you know, I was a sports psychology, performance psychology before I got to like the cognitive stuff. And one of the main talking points I used to do with my athletes, especially younger ones, would be, like you said, they both feel it. We feel nervousness. The opponent feels nervousness. But you don't want to show it because the minute... You show your lesser your level of confidence, your vulnerability, your yeah. opponent's going to go up. Because let's say he or she, let's say in your case, she's in the other side of the ring in the corner and you both got your stale face on looking mean, ready. But in her head, she's like, I'm going against the million dollar baby. Yeah. Maureen yeah. Shea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the minute you say, oh my God, this girl, she may be younger. I don't know. Yeah. It's about who really shows her hand first. And the minute, let's say, I know you're tough, but let's say you show your hand. Yeah. The minute you go... And your face drops a yeah, little. She's gonna be like, huh? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. You know what? Yep. And not saying you'll lose because of that, but it gives but them know, a slight confidence. But you know what's boost. funny? It's not even just in the stare. I mean, it's from the weigh-ins. Oh, yeah. From the first, it's from the weigh-ins. Oh, yeah, for you guys, it's then a lot of parts you can see then the there's the, Then there's the walkout. Then mm -hmm. there's the posture. Then there's the mm -hmm. energy. So whatever you're feeling, like, you have to hold... Like, I always felt... I mean, I never... I always felt like I was... I always felt like I was Mike Tyson in there. <laughs> That's how I always referred to myself. I said, I don't care who I'm fighting. I'm Mike Tyson. Like, I'm going to kill him. Mm -hmm. You know, because... That's what I felt, you know, I felt, and believe it or not, you want to know why? Because my first time watching boxing was watching Tyson fight Holyfield. Really? And you know what fight it was? When Tyson bit Holyfield's yeah. ear. Infamous ear bite. And you know what? <laughs> I think that's one of my earliest fights too. First time I ever saw it, ever saw boxing. But you know what I related to? Not the boxing. The rage that Tyson felt when he bit his ear. I felt that rage when I was younger. I had, I had, like I said, I had a lot of emotional issues. I had a lot of struggling um, verbalizing or you know my my feelings. And I was also raised by a pretty tough um, old Irish Catholic cop, you know, who was uh, a lot older than me. My dad, who I loved to death, you know, and but he he raised me like a human. And, you know, when you're the daughter of a cop, it's like one of two things. And I spoke to Roger about this, too. You know, you either treat your kid like a criminal or, you or you're very protective of them. Or you got to find the balance where you're like. I think that's more so with women or, or girls or boys. You know, I don't you know. know we, you I know, my know. dad's police, too. Yeah, yeah, so. I can only tell you what I felt. I felt at least maybe it was the era or maybe it was because of my father's background. But I felt well, like my, my father. My brother's the same age as you. So I feel like, I don't know, maybe it's a girl thing. your dad? Uh, six, now 60. Okay, my dad was 80. So oh. my dad, do you remember? I'm, a, I'm my little, parents yeah. had so my he was mom, born in the my 30s? dad. No, my, my dad. Yeah, my dad. Well, my dad was born in 41. 41. Oh, yeah. So my so dad was, was 40. He was older. 41 when he had me. Ah, uh, okay, yeah. So I were 10. Well, that's, my dad that's, was 23 or 24 okay. when my big brother so, was born. He so was 30 when, something when I was born. So my brother was born. My brother, my father was 31, and he was 41 when they had me. My mom was 38. My mom was 28 when she had mm -hmm. my brother. So there's 10 years between me and my brother. Okay. So you got to remember, there's all. And my father was also a cop in the Bronx in the 70s and 80s. That so cracking. You gotta understand, you gotta understand that there's crazy a lot. in those streets. So there's a lot. So his mental, you know, it's gonna affect and how he, he had raises bipolar. his kids. And he didn't probably know that till when? 40, Later, 40, 50s, 40, 40, 40, 40, no, 43. So two years after sixty percent of his life. And when you think about mental health, like this is why we need to talk about this stuff. Mental health is not necessarily like a, a, a handicap or a disease, no. but it does alter how you live. And if the people around you don't know that. It's not saying it's a past to be bad or wrong, but it can facilitate a better environment for your family to know, oh, he or she is dealing with this. So not necessarily he gets away with murder, but maybe I can go about it a different way. Because if you don't know that, your mom, you, whoever. Well, as you communicate, mm -hmm. but I think it's also, this is where I always go back to responsibility of the individual. And I always look at myself like, what's my responsibility here? And I think that, you know, I, I learned through that because I wished, you know, you know, the alcoholic in my life, I wish he would have taken more responsibility for his stuff and he didn't. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, okay, well, I don't want to be like that. So how can I be better at being for me, you know, with my addiction and my issues? Now I struggled with depression. I was, I was diagnosed bipolar when I was 14 years old, because this is what, 95. And back then they thought that, oh, well, if your father's bipolar, your uncle's bipolar, that's got to be genetic. You got to be bipolar. Yeah, and that's that science on that is a little so shaky. So now think about I'm 14 years old being put on lithium, which is a very strong Changing drug. Brain chemistry before Completely. your brain even fully developed. Yeah. I started losing my hair. I forgot how long I was on it for, but I was on, I, for, I even forgot the, how many milligrams. And then they took me off of it because my hair was falling out mm. and they put me on Depakote which is another strong drug. And then Depakote didn't work for me. And then they put me on Lamic they put me on Prozac, Lamictal, Topamax, Wellbutrin. Like I've gone through an array of, of, of medications. I'm not against medication. Let me just make that statement. However, 
I think with myself under my understanding of myself and I'm also a writer. So I would journal my feelings cause I didn't know how to verbalize my feelings. So I would write down my feelings. I realized that I was getting these feelings of depression during certain times of the year. It wasn't consistent. There was a pattern. It was during the winter months. It was That's starting common, in. Yeah. So it was starting in you know, September, end of September, October, all the way until like March, end of March. And then I started to come out of it in March, but I didn't even know, like I couldn't be, I couldn't control it during those other months. So, um, I spoke to a doctor about it and they said, you know, um, they had me on light therapy. You know, it was my serotonin levels in my brain. They put me on SSRIs they and all these other things, but they didn't work for me, which caused me to move to California and want to experience consistent sunlight. So when I got older and I realized like, oh, it's sunlight, I would actually, whenever I was on medication, or I was coming off of it. I would go to California to visit my aunt for a week and I felt better in California. So I always correlated California with feeling better. So I said, well, maybe I need to move there. And I did when I was 31, I moved there. I got off of the medication I was on. And then, um, while I was out there, I realized what my misdiagnosis was. I actually have ADHD and depression. Mm -hmm. So here I am. Okay. No, I have a little seasonal affective disorder is the type of depression I have. So it's seasonal. So that's why living in, I'm still off medication and living in Florida helps. I think now though, what happened was I understood the tools because I still struggle with depression. Like I still get my little bouts, especially when it's gloomy here, but I know what to do to not let it consume me. So I know to get up, I I know for me, get up and get out. So I have an emotional support animal. I have my dog. um, I know know your dog, but I didn't know that was. Yeah. So, yeah. And a lot of people don't know, because I mean, I haven't, which I'm glad. Thank you for the opportunity for me to be able to talk about this, you know, because it's kind of, you know, just a different place, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, But that's why I have my dog. I'm always looking for ways to not let my, not let it beat me, whatever it is, you know. So I, I get up in the morning and my responsibility is to my dog. So I get up and I walk my dog and it gets me out of the house. Well, you, you know, you just indirectly made a point that's very important because we spoke about this before we started the podcast that you had got diagnosed because of familial patterns for bipolar. And that's typical, especially in those well, days. behavior. Well, that's what I'm saying. So this is why it's so important with the mental health conversation when people seek out therapy or whatever it is. There's two sizes, I think. The self-diagnosers, which is out of hand too. People on TikTok or Instagram, oh, I have ADHD, I'm bipolar. And the other side is people's like, no, mental health is a, is a myth or a joke. Because when you look at the symptomology of certain dis- disorders or whatever it may be, a lot of them have crossover. Because if you say, let's take ADHD and depression, what do those consist of? Depression, your mood drops down, you're lethargic, you don't want to do stuff, you're less social, you might eat more, eat less. Then on the other side, ADHD, you're more antsy, you're impulsive. So that can get confused for mania. And the and bipolar is the high. You have to have the manic episode, at least one, right? It's bringing back me to my clinical psych days. Yeah. You have to have at least one manic episode yeah. before you can be diagnosed with bipolar. You have to have at least one. So you being ADHD could come to, sometimes present as that. Right. And now they're saying, oh, she must be bipolar when it, it really wasn't. Now you talk about the medication. So well, it was, like, it was funny because when I, I was in California and I remember I was seeing my psychiatrist and... Uh, my, I dyed my hair red, like really, really red. And I came into the office one day and he just looked at me and he was like, what brought this upon the, uh, <laughs> what happened here? You know, it was just kind of like, oh my gosh, like you, you know, and then, you know, but then obviously I'm not bipolar because, you know, he knew that I wasn't. So I'm not mad that they mm-hmm. diagnosed me bipolar and they put me on this medication, but you know, I can't be, cause I understand back then it was a lot different. My psychiatrist, oh, yeah. so, I, but what I do so remember is back then and people who can relate to all this, you know, my psychiatrist looked like Abe Lincoln and he sat in this big chair and he was smoking cigarettes. <laughs> so just to get, and shaking. And I'm Abe like, Lincoln. now that I think back, I'm like, so you're going to medicate me, <laughs> you know, now that I think back, but you know, so, um, but anyway, I found a wonderful psychiatrist in California. Uh, shout out to Dr. Mendiola. Um, I love him to death. He's, he's amazing. He's there in Ventura, California. He actually turned me on to something called TMS. Transcranial magnetic uh, stimulation. stimulation. That's it. I'm not too familiar with it, but I'm, I'm familiar Very with it. Very interesting. An so I did it. It's a commitment. So, yeah, elaborate on it. It was, it's so I don't know. I'm, I mean, I might be off a little bit, but it was like, I want to say like four or six weeks of like 20 to 40 minute sessions. And I think, I want to say it was like two or three times a week. What but what they involved? do is, yeah. so they, they, if they put this, it's like a magnetic and it's like ticks. It almost sounds like, you know, when you're getting an MRI, like the, mm-hmm. not as loud, but it's almost like that. And it's like ticking in your head. So it's like, 
trying to like, tr I mean, I'm going to totally butch, but it's like triggering <laughs> and trying to like, I don't know if it's like wake up or balance whatever it is that you're lacking your, your okay. levels, you know? Um, but it wasn't, I don't, when I first did it, not a lot of people knew about it. It's definitely more popular now. Um, but I highly recommend, you know, people checking that out. I do feel that it definitely did help me. Um, I, my, my, my depression isn't as all at all as severe, but I also think people need to recognize life situations and what can cause depression. Of you course. know, um, you got a lot of fighters going back to the fighters, you know, going back to look, look at overtraining. I mean, this all ties in you're oh, yeah. overtraining. Yeah. So you train, train, train super, super hard. And you're not working on your mind, but you're train, train, train. Then you go into a fight and then you lose that triggers a depression that triggers like yeah. a damn, no fighter. I don't care who you are. You can walk out and be like, Oh, I'm good. No, they're <laughs> not. They're not good. No fighter is good with losing. You know, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Oh, you know, human is good. With yeah. Losing. Well, you know, Even but then, people not athletic, well, don't some like go them. in, some go in just, you know, and there's opponents with people that go in and they're like, I'm here to lose. Okay. Like there, no, there, okay. they are. There I, are I, I, I get what you're saying. It's unfortunate, yeah. which that's a whole other set of mm -hmm. things, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Like whatever. But you know, yeah, nobody's good with it. It's going to affect you no matter what. But even breakups, relationships, ah, failure, relationships. anything with failure, you know? And I think that, um, you know, I also feel that, you know, especially with relationships, and I think that this is where it affects you know, um, people, uh, the fighters, you know, not having the right partner or the proper partner, not, it's very difficult to be with a fighter. Let me tell you, it's definitely not easy. I don't know personally, but yeah, I can tell head. you it's definitely <laughs> not easy. Um, I think being with a female fighter, but that's why I've done so much work on myself mm -hmm. because I want to be a better partner too. You know, I want to make sure that I don't fall on that stigma of like, Oh, cause before it was like, Oh, well, I'm a fighter. So you got to deal with this. Like I can't get, but I don't think that's true unless you make it true. I think with the right partner, it's like, listen, I got a fight coming up. I got four weeks where I'm going to struggle. You know, it's about communicating. You have to be a better course, communicator. Yeah. But that's any relationship. Yeah, yeah. So it, it transcends. The, like if I use myself with my business endeavors, I can say that played a big role in a lot of times not working because like you said, the partner has to understand if you're going to spend six to eight weeks prepping for a fight, there's certain social occasions you're not going to be able to participate in not because you're not a party pooper no, like, or you can't eat or you can't yeah, or, so, you're tired, or you're tired or your libido's so, low like so there's a lot of things they can't be like mad at you they can't take it you personal. don't want to do anything yeah. fun it's like not even want to be fun the, the greater goal is you have to win this fight well that's why i stayed single for most of my career i mean i did have relationships but i realized on my part because i have to look at like what what role did i play in them i'm not going to blame all my exes for it not working it just didn't work hmm. you know so, what i mean so like can i make a point of that We've had many conversations yeah. with this stuff, yeah. but I don't know how it's going to sound, people, because I'm not one of those red pill, manosphere type of guys. But it's like accountability of saying that you don't see that a lot no. from women. But I think my mental I might get illness. I might get butchered for that for <laughs> saying think, what I just no, said. Yeah. But, but I think my mental, my mental illness and my struggle with mental health really made me become more accountable mm. and more, you know, because that's important because yeah. you can have a healthy but relationship. Think about of any it. Kind but think about how it that. started with the alcoholic in my life. Why I went to Al-Anon. I didn't go to Al-Anon for him. I went to Al-Anon for me to figure out how to do this, which it came from a, a self, self more awareness? selfish point. Oh. But no, it, I went there for me. But I realized what I learned was that, you know, I got to look at my behaviors because they're the ones that are sick. Mm -hmm. So I can't expect them. It's like expecting a one-armed person to, <laughs> you know, play, you know, I don't know, play catch or right you know what i mean so you yeah, can't i, I get what that. you're saying yeah, technically right. still so catch you can, yeah, but no, but i yeah, get what you're saying catch, but you gotta throw but you know it's like yeah. you know i'm talking about like a glove and a gun i got guys yeah. you know i, I mean? know what like, you were getting thank at you, thank you but jim like, abbott remember yeah. him yeah, 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 yeah okay i'm getting i'm getting off topic i we know what she meant guys so that's the thing you know what i'm saying so you got to look at and it's not that the other person is sick so they're beneath me it's like okay what can i do to be better for me but how can i have empathy for that person too you know, and it's hard, believe me, it's hard, especially in relationships when, you know, the other person's going through something and you're like, you know, you want to fix it, you know, and that starts with codependency and this whole, the whole Ooh, thing. Coders. We can talk there's about There's a lot of words you're of bringing up that, like I said, this is not my forte because there's a whole industry. Have you heard of the, the red pill community or whatever? It's kind of like, for those who don't know, it's where a lot of men are actually coming together and pointing out things that aren't been haven't been too favorable of women that they really haven't talked about in years because we're a few years apart, but we were both born in the eighties. And I think around that time, the narrative of "What have you done for me lately, Janet Jackson?" Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ain't nothing going on with but the rent. That narrative that that was Gen X people because yeah. we were just kids. 
So they were like teens and young adults. That set the tone, I think, for where we are today. And I'm not excusing men's behavior or women's behavior because I'm big on like human because that's why I study human behavior, right? Humans as a whole have tendencies that aren't always favorable. But I feel since the mid to late 70s, early 80s, there's been this narrative that it's only been the men. And now with the going back to the red pill manager space, and there's extremes to it. Don't get me wrong. There's sides where they go too far. But they're trying to say like the guys like Kevin Samuels, rest in peace, he died a few months ago. He was saying a lot of unfavorable things, but they were true that women were doing nowadays. And he was getting a lot of backlash. For example, one was like saying standards or or saying you should have preferences, obviously, but what do you hold on to? Because some things well, make sense and some don't. Okay, so yes, I agree. So there's so there's yeah, I think that a woman should have her non-negotiables. I think a man should have his non-negotiables. But, uh, but I, I think sometimes but the flexibility think, on okay, those but, for men yes. aren't accepted as much. If I, like say for example, if I say yeah, but what do you so you gotta say the where where my non negotiables have more to do with with foundation. But that's a, that's good though. Yes, those aren't like certain. It's not like oh you need to it's it's and it's also like for me like um, work ethic is is part of it. You have to have a good mm -hmm. work ethic to be with me. Okay, you don't have to be a millionaire, but I have to know that you have a <laughs> good work. That's one of the points a lot of these thing, women though. are saying but that's nowadays. That's the thing. It's like oh well, they should make and. But, you know, I think that's group think though. I think they don't really care about that, but it just sounds good. I think most women, I could be wrong, they care about it to a very surface level extent because let's be real, there's not that many millionaires. So these non-millionaire guys are still getting married and still having kids and all that. So obviously someone's having relationships with them. Yeah. I think it just sounds good because now, like, you know me, I'm a history guy too. And we used to not be able to make these like choices, but it's 2022 and we have more freedoms because back in like, say 150 years ago, it was survival. So if I married you, it had to make sense. It, it, it didn't matter how cool you were, what your car you drove. Like these things didn't matter. It meant if we had a baby and had a family and we grew together, can you make sure I'm protected and provided for? And can I make sure the kids grow up properly? That was it. But I feel like nowadays there's so well, there's many so reasons many, we can get mad Well, there's about so things. many other variables that exactly. take place. And I know that, um, you know, Derek posted something the other day about, he actually sent it to me too, about, you know, people not having kids today because of, you know, you know, you know, they don't realize like, you know, what the responsibilities are and who's raising the kid because everybody wants to have a career too. And I, yeah. but I think that, and I, I, I found that interesting and I'm like, yeah, there's truth to that. But I feel that I could, you know, me personally, I'm not saying I haven't done it, you know, but I feel like, oh, wow. I wonder if I, I'd have to explore that a little bit more being able to have a child. And because again, I'm 41 years old. So, you know, my time of having a child is in like, oh, I mean, Hillary Swank just got pregnant. She's pregnant I'm with twins at 48 yeah. years old. God bless her, which is awesome. But it's not the, like, it's an outlier. Most women, it wouldn't yeah, be wise yeah, to wait yeah. till you're 48 from a biological standpoint. And that's one of the other points that the Kevin Samuels guy would talk about and girls would get mad and they would use the exception. And you know me, I'm a man of science. Would you pick the outlier or the, the, the generalization? Because if I say, let's use a more extreme example. Here's a parachute. I have a parachute. About to jump out of a plane. There's a 5% chance of opening. It can open, but it's 5%. Are you jumping out that plane? Probably not. And it's going back to this. It's like, do women get pregnant at 47 to have a healthy baby? Yes. But it's not the norm. So if you have a choice, they would argue that, but they would fight them. And that's going back to where, I guess, where you say preferences and standards. I'm uh, going to segue. There's a book called The Science of Happily Ever After. I know you're a reader. So if you ever want to check that out, if you haven't. It's called The Science of Happily Ever After. And I, I know the author, not personally, we, we're Instagram friends. He's a psychologist named Tai Tashiro. And the great thing about the book, it takes all these, these talking points and breaks down the actual psychology and science of it from the calories of love, like how calories played a role in finding a partner. It's, it's crazy how he goes into it. It's very Interesting. unique. And it, yeah. Yeah, he's a very good writer. No, I like that. And I feel, I feel like, you know, I do feel like there's so many things out there, but I also feel, but again, this all ties back to the individual and their mental health. Like, mm -hmm. have you worked yeah. on yourself? You have you take it out you know, on your yeah, No, you can't. And that's the thing, person. like healing and understanding. And I think a lot of people, you know, they go through life and they just go through life. So they're mm -hmm. not stopping and being like, okay, you know, That's what's wrong or what, what can I do to be better and how? And it's, again, well, going that back. It takes self-reflection and a lot of people, men or women, don't So really Yes. That. And so you go back to these fighters and boxers I'll talk about. So majority of male boxers get into the sport. A lot of them, how it started was from poverty. You know, a lot of them came from, from very tough backgrounds and it was a better way to make money. You know, um, very few do you see 
collegiate athletes go to boxing unless oh, they, I, but yeah. unless they have injury or something like that, but then they've already built a, a platform for themselves and then yeah. they can leverage it and use it as marketing, you know? So you got to look at it from this background. So most of these fighters, and I've only, I know this from being in these I don't know how many camps I've been or how many gyms I've trained in that I've met so many tons of fighters, like thousands of fighters that I sit there and I'm just like, Hmm, like the first thing I would want to know is like, what's their family life? Like, where did they come from? What's their background? Like, you know, and I think that that's a huge part of helping, you know, but a lot of fighters don't want to go back there. They just want to continue fighting. Cause listen, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But mm -hmm. guess what? Eventually you're going to break. <laughs> eventually it's going to break true. eventually. And, and it's this, and there's life after boxing. So it may work for you. It may be your fuel. And it was mine. Listen, I fought in the beginning of my career. I fought to prove my father wrong. Cause my father said in this house, you have to work and go to school. You can't do all three. I said, watch me. I worked, I went to school and I boxed. Then after that, it was million dollar baby. Then I wanted to prove that I wasn't just a sparring partner for an actress. Talk about million dollar baby. Yeah. I think we should talk about that. That's pretty interesting. I'll get, well, so I was, I was, um, 20, three years old and I had, I don't know how many amateur fights. I only had 12. So I think like maybe nine, it was like nine amateur fights. And, um, Hillary Swank came to the gym to, um, prepare for the role of million dollar baby as a boxer. And, um, she was, she was get, working with my coach at the time, Hector Roca. And then Hector Roca partnered me with her and we worked together. We sparred together. We worked together and, um, she started to, we became friends and we started to just share. I shared a lot of my story with her. I, you know, it was interesting because, and I said this on a post on my Instagram the other day, you know, I just told the truth. So when they found out she was working with, she asked me too, how'd you get into boxing? I said, Oh, I was in an abusive relationship, <laughs> you know? And, and I went, I went there to better myself for him. And I was, you know, I just felt like I was nobody. And I thought maybe because he worked out. So I thought if I worked out, I'd be better. And then I walked to the back and there was a boxing ring and, you know, our relationship started from there. And then when she, after people found out that she was working with me, the media, um, and they heard that it was up for an Oscar. She, the media came into the gym and they wanted to meet me and they met me and they asked me that question. They said, why, how did you get into boxing? And then I stole the truth. And then it kind of just went from there where people were like, wow. And believe it or not, me talking about my abusive relationship, me talking about why I got into boxing, it really was almost like it helped me a lot. And which I found, you know, I'm also, you know, I do motivational speaking, you know, that. So I, I was always told I was a really good speaker, you know, when I was younger and in, in communications classes and stuff in college and in high school. And so I just found I was able to tell a story and I started telling my story. And then I started talking about my depression and I started talking about, because it had to make sense and I had to be, I wanted to be honest. So people were like, well, you got into boxing just because you'd be this relationship. But what else happened? Then I had, I was, you know, I went through depression. I went through compulsive eating, you know, and I never talked about my father's bipolar disorder because my father, he's passed now. But at the time he was, I just didn't feel like it was okay to, and then he told me it was okay, you mm -hmm. know, eventually, but I honored him and it was his story to tell, not mine, but he did affect my life and it did affect my boxing, you know? Um, so I think for me, like that was the whole, you know, the whole thing with million dollar baby. That's how I got into it. But that's impressive. You're, you're on an Oscar winning movie cast, basically. In well, I wasn't in the film. I know you were in wasn't the film, in but I was part of it. Being a you know, slash I, yeah. foreign part, yeah. I feel that's pretty important. You know, I look at my life, Nick, and, I, and I'm so grateful because I never asked for a lot of things. I just really did the work on myself and tried to be in the best position to you know, and even now, you know, even now with, with where I'm at in my life, I'm still fighting and I'm, you know, always being, putting myself in the best position to succeed, whether it's in, in my sport, whether it's in business, you know, working for Phil, whether it's in a relationship, you know, I, I like success and I like to succeed and that's not with ego. I just like things to work out. Um, I know things don't always work out and I've learned now, especially with boxing, because I said, you know, I realize with my understanding of self, I said, I was letting the sport of boxing take my love away of the actual act of boxing. Yeah. So I was letting the business uh, take yeah. away my love of the actual sport and my ability to do the sport. So now when I go to the gym, I'm not going there because I have a fight coming up. I'm not going there because I'm staying ready. I'm going there because I genuinely love boxing and I love the art and I love the sport mm -hmm. and I'm going there for me. So what I was trying to say before was that I always was trying to, I was trying to figure out my why. And I know a lot of people have talked about your why you have to be able to rediscover your why, but in order to know your why you need to understand yourself and you need to understand what your limitations are. What are your limiting factors and how do you remove them from your life? 
And I see people sometimes, and I've had somebody say to me, like, oh, you think you're a therapist. Just because you went to therapy doesn't mean you know everything. No. And that's true. I don't. But I love to share, and I love to, you know, help, and I love to yeah, advise if asked, you know. Work. Being yeah. an advocate is important. Well, the this. thing is, I've been in therapy since I was seven. And I've been through multiple therapists, multiple psychiatrists. I've had good experience. I've had bad experience. You know, I've gone through it all. I've been through multiple medications. I've been in a sport where I was not supposed to succeed. I was not supposed to get to where I am. You know, um, I had a lot of things put against me, but I overcame challenges and I didn't, I, I used to carry it with me, but I've learned to let those things go and just accept who I am. But I think that comes with maturity and age, um, where it's true. Forties are amazing because you really know who you are. Like you learn in your twenties, you make mistakes in your thirties, you start to, you know, rediscover yourself, but also, um, make sure you don't make those mistakes again. But at 40, it's just like, wow, it's amazing. You know, but I think, you know, going back to everything we talked about, I think the, it's really understanding your whys and understanding yourself and not being afraid to look at the, the bad things, the, the mistakes you made and why, why do you continue making them? And I still have to do that myself. You know, I still yeah. do that. And it's tough because a lot of it's triggers. I mean, that's a topic for another day. I mean, triggers, where do they come from? People don't even know they're triggers. You know, you have to recognize your triggers yeah. and then ask the person if you're in a relationship and that person triggers you have the ability and the maturity to say, Hey, you know, when you say that it triggers me, can you maybe choose a different kind of words or can we, can you help me to just not help ask for help, you know, in the relationship, but that's when you're really going to know if your partner yeah. wants to be with you. <laughs> I think a pro this is from my personal experience is not just a professional in psychology, but just being in relationships over the last, well, I'm 33. So I say first real relationship was probably like 21. So last 13, 12, 13 years. And it's like, what I noticed is a lot of times that can only work what you said of communicating and knowing the triggers. But I feel that person has to be able, like you say, knowing your your they reasons. They have to be as emotionally healthy. Yeah, because a lot of times what I've noticed and I've seen firsthand that happen to me, because I'm like you, I have this self-awareness of my mental health for a long time, little different trajectory how I got here, but basically it's like, if they have these things going on and they, they're going to like project it onto you, no matter how much, because they tie their, their not necessarily value, but they're like, they predicate more so their emotional well-being on what you do or don't do. And that's, that's dangerous because relationships of any kind, friends, family, loved ones, boyfriend, girlfriend, are dynamic. There's going to be days when you can't stand me. But if you can't stand me for that day or two for whatever reason, because I upset you or you just are in a mood, and you predicate that off of me, that's not fair. Because now all of a sudden, you, you're you going to put me in a, a box where eventually you're going to resent me off of something you made in your head. And how can you get to the point, like you say, knowing your triggers when... You are the trick. Like, if we're gonna use a gun reference, like a trigger, like you put the bullet in the chamber first. I may have pulled the trigger for you and triggered you, but who put the bullet in the chamber first? So that's an interesting thing that you say because I, I recently went through something like that where it's like I do, and I have this problem where I'm telling myself a story when I don't understand somebody and I can't communicate with them or I ask them and they can't explain it to me. I keep asking the questions to try to understand. It that's great. So that's what happens. So, but yes. take that the wrong and so, way. But, but then, then, but then if that person still, cause if that person isn't good at communicating or they're working on themselves, they're not able to communicate it completely. And you just, yeah, I have to learn to just be okay with not being okay. So I have and to that's learn. Another insight that you're profound for that, because if you have that, you can be able to say, you know what? They're not there. So I won't let them take that out of me. And I won't get mad because some people aren't there. So They'll say, oh, you're mad. Well, don't you know you do? It? And now you got this whole. It's so conundrum. hard. It's so hard. But I feel like where I'm at in my life now, I'm I'm better able to do it. But it still doesn't mean it doesn't affect me. Of and and, and emotionally, you know. And mental toughness. Mental tough people that's where you're are like, invincible. Okay, so what do I got to do to reassess this or re reevaluate my position, my stance? And if this person has to go through whatever they have to go through and I have to take care of myself, you know what I mean? It's just tough. It's always, but that's any relationship. It's not even romantic. It's mm -hmm. friendships. Oh, yeah. I mean, I've had friendships where I told friends, like people that I cared about, I'm like, listen, I, I can't be your friend anymore. And I know that sounds so immature, but I'm like, I can't I because you know what? It's like, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's, hard, yeah, it's very hard for me. And I said that to two people in my life. I said, I can't be your friend anymore. And they're like, why? I'm like, because this is becoming a job and, and it's not me. I'm, I'm not, and you're not communicating to me what you need for me to be a better friend, but I'm asking you and you're just not, you're getting upset. You're not, you're not respecting what I'm saying, you know, and listen, everything's work. People, it just, it depends on the level of work that it's going to be. You're going to say, oh, relationships should be easy. No, they shouldn't. That's, can, can we go on that, for example? <laughs> yeah, no. Can we go on that? Because yeah. 
from like we're two different ends of the dating pool. I, I, I'm with women, you with the men. And what I've noticed is there is this narrative. I can't speak on the men, but what I noticed for dating women is they think it should be easy. And I think it should be not hard, if that makes sense. It shouldn't so, be easy, but it shouldn't be not hard. Because there's going to be times where it is a struggle, but it shouldn't be like, but I meet it you, depends. you meet me and we're perfect. That's no, impossible. but it depends Nothing on where, like but I think it depends on where you're both at and what you're mm -hmm. both dealing with. So there's moments of heart and sometimes it's going to be a little bit harder than expected because of where that other person is, but you know, setting it up, but again, having two self-aware people who are willing to work on themselves and willing to recognize their shortcomings coming together is I think the, the good. Enough. Yes, but that's a good <laughs> foundation. But you know what? A lot of people learn about themselves and discover themselves in a relationship. You know, a lot of people, and I mean, I have, I've, I've learned about myself in every relationship I've been in, you know, but then it's like, okay, well, can we make it through this time, this, this rough patch where I'm gonna be honest, you're a little more self-aware than most that I, I, I know I'm not trying to boost but you, know up, but it's it like, you don't see that a lot of people, cause there, there's a narrative of like, I'm very observant in the beauty of social media is why people say, oh, it's just social media. It tells a lot about a person. It may not be your whole personality or life. But if you see people for the last decade, because social media has been pretty big for a while now, last decade, if they're always talking about these kind of issues, it's safe to say they're probably not learning from these relationships because yeah. we're in our 30s and 40s now. At what point do you realize you're getting the same guy or girl because you just you're attracted to, to that? Yeah. Exactly. So you're very self aware. I'm not saying it's rare to the point there's just a few, but, no, but I, I feel like there's less aware yeah, people. Yeah, but I think, but think there's, all, there's, but then like going back to what you said about Instagram too, where people are saying like, oh, I have their self diagnosing too. That's so that's, there's a whole, but there's a whole thing. So it's probably the same people that self diagnosing. I see some people, oh yeah, I'm ADHD or even autism. Like that's extreme. So it is. It's, Social media is making things out of him, but yeah. The, the and whole... I and I realized that, and that's why I posted the other day a story about you know about the fighters and about what I see and what I recognize and you know the thing about you know um, overworking and thinking that that's going to be it and not really focusing on mental health and um, I wrote that I mean I, I just did a two minute I mean a two story post. And I got like 15 people saying, can you send me more of these? Can we do more yeah. of these? That's why I was really excited to do this podcast because I told, I responded to them. I said, well, I'm actually doing a podcast about some of it, you know, um, you know, in, in the next week. So, you know, yeah, release this and we'll clip this up. There's so many clips we can run where you could like, you see my page, I'd make content out of anything. But I think, I think <laughs> at the end of the day, like to, to wrap everything up, I mean, even if I, I mean, we can talk about these things and, and if anybody has questions for me, feel free to, to message me, Maureen, um, M-A-U-R-E-N underscore S-H-E. EA is my Instagram. Yeah, it'll be there. So you can always message me, but you know, and, and again, I'm not, I'm not, I don't have a background, but I have a lot of life experience and I have a lot of self experience of where I'm, I'm learning and, you know, figuring things out. And I can always, I like to, that's why I do the motivational speaking. I like to share my story and how I got through it and then help people to discover that within themselves because, you know, finding your passion was a big thing for me and my passion found through boxing. But what I found is, you know, is my passion to be physical you know, and to have a physical outlet. And that's what, cause I think I would have been passionate about any physical sport, whether it was, you know, uh, you know, um, you know, powerlifting. Cause I found a love for, for, for lifting yeah. weights. You know, I've always thought I had that. I think I would have been good at anything that I did, you know, had I, had I was able to use that as my platform to, which I've done for boxing, you know, but I think, um, you know, just, just recognize yourself, take a minute. I think a lot of people are just in such a rush. They don't stop and look at themselves and think about, you know, how they can be better for them. And in turn, when you're better for yourself, it's going to make you better for everybody else. But it's got to be not a better that, oh, it serves me like selfish way. It's yeah. got to be, a, 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 you know, a, a, I can be better at, you know, to make better relationships, make better choices. And, you know, whether it's any relationship you have, look at the relationships in your life. And I'd say start with your relationship with food because majority of people are unhealthy. Start with your relationship with, with um you know, if you want to quit smoking cigarettes, you want to quit it's your health, your relationship with your health, like all these relationships, they, they, they fall into every other relationship in your life, whether it's, you know, friendships, romantic it's business. Yeah, all it all really does. Yeah. And I think, you know, you just got to you know, work on one thing at a time, but it's got to start with yourself and your fundamentals, which I think is your activity level, you know, making sure you're getting out and doing a 10 minute walk. You don't have to be a professional athlete. You know, but I think even they talk about it with in entrepreneur books about physical health. You know, mental science health. Behind that, obviously, we won't get into right now. Yeah, that all definitely stuff. ties yeah, into a sure. lot of what I, mean, I do yeah. too. Yeah, and I know, like, look that. at look at what look at what Phil's doing with Timberland. 
you know, and what he's doing with, with Timberland's physical health and how mm -hmm. it's turned. I mean, and he went from a really, a really rough place to getting to where he is yep. now and he's on it. I mean, he was there at the gym train this morning and yep. I can see him, his mental battle, but he's there pushing and he's mm -hmm. showing up and he's doing the work. And that's, that's, you know, that's commendable. And that's great to see. Cause I grew up, my big brother put me onto his music. So working with him is and he's a got a platform to too. really change the way that a mm -hmm. lot of people view life. Yep. And I think, and I love seeing that, especially people like him doing this, you know, mm -hmm. so it's just yeah. things like that. So I guess we'll wrap up with that. That was a lot, and I'm I'm glad to put it out. So you said where to find you. Say it one more time, just to put Maureen it out underscore Shay on Instagram. I mean, I'm on Facebook, Maureen Shay. I have Twitter, Maureen Shay. Um, but feel free to reach out. You know, I, I'll answer. And you know, I guess I need to do more of these uh, videos. Hey, maybe this to. could be a tell uh, Phil to stop working me so hard. That's what it is. <laughs> hey. <laughs> no, it's not. I have a lot of stuff going on, a lot of a lot of things, but I need to I'm not I'm not part of this generation. I'm part of this generation where the uh, camera's over there. This is a different thing. <laughs> well, we may do more of these, so check that out. So thanks once again for coming through. Thank you for and having me. As I always say, get your mind right.